All right, we are back here on the podcast, getting ready for the hockey season here. Join me today to break down. It's coming an annual tradition. Uh, the host of the Sports in the Waiting Room podcast, uh, Christopher Russo, is here. Christopher, how are you? I'm Mike. I'm all right. Thanks. I appreciate you having me back, and it, I I like having that sort of stability, having being back here every year now. Yeah, it's becoming a tradition. I'm very I, I do appreciate tradition on the podcast. Yeah, well, it's it, it's good to be here, and I think just talking about hockey. Most notable, I, it's what I do most of the time, so it's fair. Yeah, so we'll go we'll touch on the locals primarily. Got a little big nap picture at the end here, but let's start with the Rangers here. Obviously, they have the big coaching change in the offseason. They fire Gerard Gallant. They bring in Peter Laviolette to be the new head coach here, which I feel like that's probably the only big change they could make during their cap situation. How do you feel like Laviolette is going to impact the Rangers? Well, it's funny. With Gallant, I thought he did a good job overall, but the big issue was the Devils series and just the match. That that was the one team I thought the Rangers matched up poorly with, for sure, was the Devils. And perhaps they could have made a run if they had gotten past that one. But that's the thing. Gallant didn't really make any adjustments after Game 3 or Game 4 when the Devils started to make their comeback and instill that sort of sense of discipline for one thing because one of their biggest issues was I think Panarin was the big one where he really just tried to do too much, tried to hand over handle the puck of the blue line, uh, make it made a huge difference. And I think just the ability to instill that North South type of hockey is going to be very important. I think Laviolette can do that. We saw a lot of that in Carolina. We saw a lot of that in Nashville where it wasn't necessarily the most skilled guys. Obviously Washington, you have Ovechkin and Baxter. You have more skilled guys in the last couple of years, but that's, that's a team that was, more shorthanded Philadelphia, another, another organization that has really benefited from his, uh, from his guidance. And I would say, yeah, the veteran, the veteran leadership and the ability just to play physical North South hockey. Yeah. It's definitely interesting to see here. And we saw in the offseason, obviously they were a little bit cap constrained. So uh, Chris Drury had to get creative to fill his roster here. He gets a good job, some veteran pickups here. He brings in Blake Wheeler. He brings in Jonathan quick to be the backup goalie. Nick Bonino, Eric Gustafson, some of the big names, bigger names coming in here. How do you feel about the moves the Rangers made in the offseason to improve on the fringes? You know, it's funny. I did a, a paper. I don't know how well it did, but I did a, a, a paper, I think, late in middle school about Moneyball and how one of the things Billy Bean said was one of the best one of the best things is not necessarily to have, you know, Yankee or now Met level money or, or Dodger level money or to be the Oakland A's or the Tampa Bay Rays and have a ridiculously low amount of money. What you want to shoot for is something like what St. Louis has, where you're a middle market kind of team and you have a little bit of money, but you don't overspend on guys. You can you can be able to, to get good talent for, for low prices and draft better. It forces you to do that. And I think having less money kind of forced Chris Drury to work on a shoestring budget. And it actually, I think, helped him a lot because he got the kind of guys that the Rangers actually needed. I know you could say that Blake Wheeler, Tyler Pitlick, Eric Gustafson, Nick Benino, they're older guys, and they're not necessarily the most skilled guys, but that's actually what they needed. And so they got guys who are veterans. They also got a lot of guys who are local, which I think is kind of key guys who really want to be there. Guys like Quick, guys like Benino, who are from Connecticut and probably love the Rangers as kids. We know Quick did. And they're cheap. They're very physical and and or they have made deep playoff runs. We saw it with Benino in Pittsburgh. We saw it with Quick, obviously, in Los Angeles. Blake Wheeler has been with the Winnipeg team that has been very, very good for a long time, but just hasn't gotten to the final. And so these are also guys that are just really hungry. So I think it was a great, great offseason for the Rangers. And I think, uh, of course, you know, you talk about Tarasenko and Kane going at the deadline and how hyped up those moves were. I thought Drury had a much better offseason than he did deadline. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how these moves pan out to the big Tarasenko, Kane deadline. Now it's a more low-key presence here. But one thing I think is going to help the Rangers a lot is this is a very big year for Capo Caco and Alexis, Alexis Lafreniere, who I was the one number two pick 2019, number one pick 2020. Neither has lived up to the hype of their draft slot here. Do you think that having Laviolette here will help get more out of them? Like, what do you think? Do you think this is the year that they take off these two? Yeah. Well, what's funny is I think these guys have been very strong on, but not necessarily on paper. I think the year the Rangers made their run to the conference final back in 2022, I thought that line of the heat, the, the kid line of Hito, Kako and Lafreniere, not necessarily going left or right, but those three guys were actually not necessarily statistically, but I thought they were the most consistent line throughout the postseason. And you go back to, I think it was game two against Tampa Bay, a line that connected on a goal that was maybe the best shift for them for that 
team the entire postseason. And I think you've seen a lot of maturity from Philip Heedle. That's obviously why he's not part of this question. But again, it's because Lafreniere was drafted one, Kako was drafted number two. It's different depending on the years. A number seven guy in one draft could be better than number, a number one guy in another draft. So these guys, I think it's more likely that Cabo Kako will really take a leap because, again, he has that extra year or maybe two years, actually, on, on Lafreniere in terms of development. And again, you know, these guys were drafted when they were 18, 19 years old. It takes time. And so I think Kako will definitely be able to make that leap. I think they should be able to keep, I think they should keep those three guys together. I think that's going to be best for them, but adaptation is really going to be key for them, whether they can play on other lines consistently with guys like Panarin, Kreider, Zabanajad, a number of different guys within that roster and whether they can shuffle around. But I think this very well could be the year for both. We've seen flashes of brilliance from both of them. And I, th I think Lafreniere is obviously a very good puck handler. I think both of those guys are also actually pretty strong defensive players as well. So, yeah, I think they are, they're very capable of making that leap this year. I think the thing for me, I'm watching Lafreniere is like, is he actually getting an opportunity to play on the right side more this year? Because I mean, he's on the left side, he's behind, probably behind Panarin and Kreider most of the way. So going on the right, probably his best chance of getting top six minutes. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you. And, and those are guys who should get top six minutes. You go back to the Rangers and you think about it, and you think about one of the reasons why perhaps John Tortorella, I'm, I know I'm going a long, long time ago, one of the reasons John Tortorella was fired was he didn't take much advantage of Chris Kreider and he didn't take much advantage of the younger guys. And so that could be a huge factor in Peter Laviolette's tenure with the Rangers. You think about, you know, Claude Giroux was only, I think, in his second season with the Flyers when Laviolette helped lead them to the final. And Giroux was perhaps the best player for that team and is maybe the best player for that organization ever besides Bobby Clark. So adapting and, and taking those younger players and, and, and giving and trusting them is going to be huge. But again, they're going, he, they're going to have to earn his trust in training camp as well, or, or hopefully have earned his trust in training camp and into the preseason as well. Yeah, that's for sure. Let's go to the devils for a minute. Obviously they had a very like headline heavy off season. They, they have the big extensions for Timo Meyer and for yes, for Brat. They make the trade for Tyler to Foley. They move on from Mackenzie Blackwood here. They trade Damon Severson away. What do you think what the devils did in the off season? I think obviously they got Tyler Toffoli, which is significant. He is a finisher. He's a guy who's won the Stanley cup before very big, very physical. He's going to be great on that top line. But I think the counter argument is that they sacrifice depth a little bit. You talk about Steverson, you talk about a guy who was a leader for a long time, very good on the back end. You could also argue they lost a little bit of, you know, their defensive ability. When you think about the, the physicality of losing miles wood, a guy like, you know, Ryan Graves departing and, they lost some of that homegrown, in many ways, defensive talent. So I think they're going to be better offensively, but I thought the biggest issue for them going into last season, because I said there, it was probably the best they'd ever been offensively as a franchise, even far better than the defensive structure that they had had when they won the Stanley Cup three times. But I thought that they needed to improve defensively, and I think they did improve defensively a bit last year but I think they're going a little too far back to that front end because they were losing blowouts to Carolina. I, I think in that, in that five game series, a lot of it was defense. A lot of it was goaltending as a matter of fact. And so I, I think the, the, who's going to be in that they're saying Vanacek, but I think who's going to be net is very important. Yeah. The, the, the goaltending question is very interesting for the devils here. Cause I mean, obviously they have opportunity. We thought they'd be connected with, L. Buke from uh, Winnipeg, that did not happen. They decided to ride the v v Vanacek uh, Schmid 1A, 1B combo here. Do you feel like that is going to work for anything? You have to go back and revisit those trade talks maybe on the deadline. You know, I think Vanacek's a good goaltender, and I think he makes sense for this organization when you consider he's not going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting. It's a very offensive minded team, something, you know, you wouldn't think you'd be saying about the Devils a while ago. But I don't understand why it seems like it's such a for, foregone conclusion that Vitek Vanacek is going to be the starter because I know it was the postseason, but, and again, Carolina obviously put them in their place, but Akira Schmid, the, the devils would not have gotten out of the first round. If not for Akira Schmid, they, they might've actually gotten swept 
by the Rangers in that first round. He was the MVP of that series. And Vitek Vanacek did not play that well, especially against Carolina. So I, I, I don't know. It was their first playoff series win in 11 years. It's the best goaltending performance they have had in the postseason, obviously, in a long, long time. And so I, I don't know if they can, I think, retain their defensive ability despite losing Graves, despite trading away Severson. And I think if they go with Schmidt and Nett, look, I think Vanacek should get significant minutes. But I think you said 1A, 1B with Vanacek and Schmidt. I think it should be vice versa. I think, I think Schmidt should be 1A. But again, it'll, you know, you got a long, long season to go. Yeah, that's for sure. You're obviously X's are very high of the Devils. Obviously, they have a very talented young core. They make the big leap last year where they are flirting with the president's trophy about two months before Boston runs away with it. They end up winning around. They get smacked by Carolina in the second round here. We saw a similar league year before with the Rangers where they go to the conference final and they sort of fell back to earth a little bit last year. Like, how do the Devils avoid having that happen to them? I think the goaltending situation is going to be. Maybe the most important thing, I think Toffoli will integrate well into the system. And Jack Hughes, I think, will, I think, still has a higher ceiling. Obviously, he would. The truth is, if not for Connor McDavid, Jack Hughes would be an incredible MVP candidate, considering what he's done for that organization. I thought he could have actually had a better postseason. I thought it looked better on paper than it actually did for him on the ice, at least in the first round series, if not the Carolina series. But the defense, yeah, the defensive ability and the leadership of Heischer and, and Halla, I think, I think were pretty key. But I think Timo Meyer is really going to have to step up because he did not do much in the postseason. So I think the goaltending, just continued development of guys like Hughes and Meyer, and I would say just doing enough on the back end. The, the defense will have to do each guy on defense for the Devils is going to have to step up a bit more this year. All right, let's go to the Islanders now. Obviously, they, I feel like, did almost nothing this offseason apart from, like, they gave, they made their, spent their money last year and this during season they gave Bo Horvat the extension here. Full year at Bo Horvat with the Islanders. What does that do for them? Yeah, you know, I, I think it provides the goal, the goal scoring spark and the youth that they desperately need because the Islanders are and have been for the last couple of years despite reaching the conference final in 2020 and 2021 and still being one of the stronger teams in the league the islanders are an older team they are one of the oldest teams in the league they might be the oldest team in the league as a matter of fact and so i think having horvat for a full year like like, should elevate them in terms of the playoff standings and of course elmont or you know on the island even though it's not national coliseum it's not fort never lose anymore that's a tough place to play and so I, i think Bo Horvat could lift them just enough in the standings that they could be a lot more dangerous. But for, for a lot of guys, it could be it could be the last run. I know that they've just brought in Lane Lambert. It's only his second season, but it's a very it's an older core aside from guys like you know, like Matt Barzell. Yeah, I'm glad you brought the point about them possibly going up in the standings here because it seems like nationally everybody seems to be down the islanders. I was reading a story on the athletic recently that like if there's always one team that falls out of the playoffs, everyone seems to think it's the Islanders. Why do you think that is not going to be the case? Well, I think first, for, for one thing, let's just do process elimination. I don't think Detroit has necessarily take. I don't think Detroit is really going to take that far a leap, that big a leap, that far a step. I don't think Ottawa is really ready to take that step yet. Buffalo, I think, is much closer but I don't know if they get to the playoffs yet. I think Don Granato is doing a great job and that roster looks excellent. There's a culture in Buffalo that, that seems really strong, you know, aside from the, the Pagul accusations, unfortunately, as of late, but Buffalo is looking more like a contender, but I think you, you have those three teams. I'm not quite sure are ready to take the leap. Then on top of that, Boston, I think is, of course, you lose Patrice Bergeron, you will regress. I don't know what having Brad Marchand as the leader in that dressing room is going to do. And I think Pittsburgh, I, I said Pittsburgh should have should have rebuilt a while ago. I, I think they're holding on a little too much. Pittsburgh missed the playoffs for the first time in a long time last year. And I think that's another, Pittsburgh's been, been regressing for a, a few seasons now, I think. And so I think on top of that, the Islanders having a full season of, Ho- of Horvat and hoping he's healthy, a full season of Matt Barzell. Remember Matt Barzell missed some time last year. 
And then you have possibly the best goalie tandem in the league. Semyon Varlamov could be a starter with a lot of teams, you could argue. And Ilya Sorokin is could very well be a Vezina finalist, if not a Vezina winner next year. And, you know, again, it was, it was Lena Solmark was probably the only guy who was really out in front of him last season. Yeah. There's you can see what happens there for sure here. In terms of the three locals here. I mean, like if you're going to prior pick, like who, how do you think they're going to do this year in terms of like, what's the ceiling for these guys, the Islanders, Rangers, and Devils. Any three of them, I, I could see any three of them actually hoisting the Stanley Cup. I think the Devils are probably in that window. The most the Devils have the most hype around them. They probably have the, they're probably in the right part of the window. Rangers are trying to extend their window. They brought in some, some older, more veteran guys who can really instill that sort of discipline and physical style of hockey into that team that can really I don't know if it's going to do them that well in the regular season, but if they can get in, it could do them wonders in the playoffs. And the Islanders are, I think, on the back end of that window. Obviously, if they draft well, and then I think they'll they'll be successful for a while with guys like Matt Barzell. But I don't know. I think any of these teams, the ceiling could be the Stanley Cup, but there's a lot of challenges with probably Carolina, most notably. Toronto's window is still open. Florida's window is still open. Devils, to me, I think are the most likely out of the three to succeed, then the Rangers, then the Islanders. I would not be surprised if all three of them make the playoffs again. Last year was the first time, I think, in 15 years that all three made it in. Yeah, I do think it's interesting, too, with the Rangers spot where they're in. I feel like everybody's kind of sleeping on them after last year because last year, oh, Rangers are going to make the big leap because they are going to go win the Cup. We're about the Patrick Kane rumors all season. Now, I feel like nobody's really talking about them anymore in terms of like everybody sort of like jumped off the wagon. I think, well, it's the Devils. I feel like it's a good spot for the Rangers to be in with the new coach. That might be perfect for them, actually, when you consider the a little bit of the hype is taken off of them and you don't have kind of guys that so ridiculously elevate your expectations like Kane or Tarasenko. Although Kane hasn't signed with anybody, there's a, a rumor that maybe he'll go to. They've been talking about the Devils. I personally think he should. I've said this like guys should go play home. Kane really so tied to upstate New York. I would. It's probably a good idea if he goes home to play for Buffalo. But if it's possibly goes back to play for the Rangers, I think he really likes it. So uh, we'll we will see what happens. I I think they're I think the Rangers are in a pretty good spot though, and I think better than a lot of people think. Yeah, for sure. Let's go nationally real quick. Any other big national headlines you're watching in terms of the NHL this season? What's caught your eye? Well, you know, I brought it up for a second, but I think Brad Marsh and taking over for Patrice Bergeron as captain. Now, look on paper, clearly he is beloved in that. You know, he's beloved in that dressing room. He's beloved in Boston. He's one of the guys where if you're a fan of an opposing team, you either, you know, he's one of those guys where either you love him if he's on your team or if you hate or you hate him if he's on another team, because he obviously he's a controversial figure in this league. One of the most, maybe one of the most disliked, disliked figures in the league outside of New England. And there have been so many antics that you can wonder whether he will actually be a good captain, even though he's a great player. And for for what he does, for what he's supposed to do, he does a pretty good job. But that should be really interesting, especially since Boston finished with the best record ever last year, or at least the most points ever in a season and didn't even get out of the first round. And so Bruin fans, so I think what well, Bruin fans really hyped up their expectations last year when they said, they were chanting, we want the cup at the end of the regular season. And you should know, if you know hockey for a long time, as I have, that's just a recipe for disaster. You're just asking for it there. Uh, secondly, I would say Columbus, their dressing room situation post Babcock. I wasn't, I, obviously Mike Babcock had a, a terrible past and I thought it was a bad move by the Blue Jackets to hire him. But I thought he was, again, without having full details and considering Boone Jenner and Johnny Goudreau were speaking positively about him after this whole thing. I thought maybe he was judged a little harshly. I wasn't sure as to what was actually, what really was the context, what actually was happening. But we're going to see if if Columbus can really join together because, you know, it, it's been one of the better run organizations in the league for considering their market and considering their youth. And remember a couple of years ago, they were, you know, they finally won a playoff series. And so we'll see what they can do under them. I would say going out West to try to make this a little more even 
McDavid really, I think, should be the, the favorite to win the Hart Trophy again. But I, the unfortunate thing is, if you're a big-time hockey fan, is that I think he's kind of nearing the realm of guys who you, you're going to say at the end of their career, oh, that's a guy who really deserved to win the Stanley Cup, but just never did. Because he hasn't really come, he's been to a conference final. He hasn't really come that close to winning the cup. And again, you talk about a generational talent like Gretzky, but Gretzky also had a generational talent like Messier and, and Paul Coffey and Yari Curry, a lot of different, Glenn Anderson, a lot of different guys, Grant Fuhrer. And so what's going to move around, what's going to be around McDavid besides Leon Dreisaitl. And, and, and we'll see about that. Vegas, Vegas was kind of a surprising cup winner for me in that I thought they were very strong, but I think they also might've lucked out in terms of matchups. They played Edmonton and they played Dallas, who I thought was the team to beat fundamentally, but they didn't have to play Colorado. And so that was huge. And then lastly, I would say Dallas's progression because they finally got to the conference final again last year, but Jamie Ben made a huge mistake with, make, in, in getting himself suspended along the way in the conference final and that's a captain with, with a lack of composure there. And so I want to see what the mindset is in that dressing room going into this year. Yeah, certainly a lot of fun seeing some of these storylines play out here. And obviously, season hasn't even started yet, so it's a little early, but we'll do it anyway. Stanley Cup picks. Who do you think is going to make the Stanley Cup final if we had to go off of the teams we're seeing right now? You know, it's really difficult. I, I would say in the East, I honestly could say any of these three teams from the New York City area, be it. Devils, Rangers, or Islanders. And I could throw out Florida still. I could throw Tampa back in the mix. I We could even go crazy and say Toronto. But I am going to say since they finally, finally got over the hump to the conference final and maybe have cured some ailments that I did not think they would have had going into the previous year, I'm going to say the Carolina Hurricanes are finally going to get to the Stanley Cup final again. And for the West, you know, we could talk about Edmonton is one could talk about the defending champion Vegas. I think LA is an outside and an outside pick to throw in there. Even Seattle or Dallas is another one as well, but I'm going to say the Colorado avalanche are going back to the Stanley cup final. Yeah, certainly as they pick here, I'm bored with you with Carolina. The either, they're kind of just been knocking on that door for so long. They feel like they're going to break through one. Of you I think this is a good, as good a year as any of them to break through. And I'm going to be, yeah. that's what I'm going to say Edmonton on the other side. I feel like, Again, as well as things like where they had the best player in the world for who knows how long he's going to maintain this level. So, like, you're not going to get through now when. Well, it's funny. When you think about it with Carolina, you almost think of it the way you thought of Tampa in the bubble, where at least Tampa had been to the final a few years before that, five years before. But Carolina has not been to the finals since 2006. It's a, it's a completely different generation of players as opposed to those the 2015 and 2020 Tampa teams. And then I think with Colorado, I mean, I, I still really don't know what's happened with Landis Gog, but I just feel like there's a stability there finally. And I think they, I think they're going to be very hungry after losing that series to Seattle and, and losing and losing at home so many times in the postseason. So yeah, I, I think it's going to be those two. I actually picked those two, I think, in 2022 when the playoffs started. I think I said it would be those two in the final. And ultimately, I was wrong on both ends, but I think Colorado got there and Carolina did ultimately get out of that very, very difficult metropolitan division. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to see how the season plays out, Chris. Thanks all the time. really appreciate it. People want to follow your podcast, follow you on social media. How can they do that? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram and X. It's uh, at Chris Russo 98. And uh, now you call it X, I guess. I, I, I don't call it X. I still call it Twitter. Like yeah. Instagram and new Twitter, like new Coke. Uh, AKA, I, AKA threads. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, re regardless, you can find me at Chris C H R I S Russo R U S S O nine eight. Or actually it's uh, Chris, pardon me. It's Chris Russo 1998. No, it's Chris Russo 98. Correction. Yeah. On on Instagram. So yeah, you can find me there. All right. That's cool. And also if you want to listen to your podcast, I can do that. Yeah. You can find us on, it helps us the most. If you listen on Spotify, that's, that's where we, that's where we create it on Spotify for podcasters. And so it does help us the most in terms of just promoting the podcast 
and just getting, you know, higher listenership doing it through Spotify, but you can also find us just anywhere you can find your podcasts. So Apple podcasts, uh, a number of, a number of different places.